essential to supplement agriculture and ease pressure on land use. I think that's absolutely critical and all the other things that were mentioned this morning. So I'll talk about resources, just, just in case you wonder what I mean by resources. I mean uh, light, I mean water uh, and nutrients. Uh, it's a very basic figure just to uh, emphasize uh, what I'm talking about when I say resources. I work mostly on light as a photosynthesis uh, scientist. The point I want to make by saying this is that uh, actually the principles that, that I use for measuring resource capture and resource use efficiency in crops are effectively the same as you would use in the vertical farming system. It may seem obvious, but it's worth saying. So we, we consider a crop system, rightly or wrongly, uh, but certainly usefully, as, as a closed system. So we input radiation, we input CO2, we input nutrients, we input water, uh, and we get an output. Uh, and we can measure efficiency, okay? In the same way you would do in a, uh, in a closed system like a vertical farming system. The principles we use are effectively the same, so we can talk the same, the same language. So I just wanted to explain one thing about why vertical farming systems are so interesting for someone who works on photosynthesis, and it's all about control of resources. If you, if you think here, uh, we have a thousand kilojoules of energy, solar energy, arriving at the top of the, top of the crop. We can look at the number of losses that you go through before you finally get to the, the efficiency, the energy content of the biomass left at the end. One of the biggest losses is the amount of light that's not absorbed by chlorophyll. About 50% of the solar spectrum is not absorbed by chlorophyll. Some reflected, there's an, an inefficiency of photochemistry I won't go into. There's all kinds of metabolic factors that, are, that, are, that rely upon whether you're looking at a, a a photosynthetic system called C3 or another <coughs> more efficient photosynthetic, photosynthetic system called C4, you get these metabolic losses and you end up with a percentage at the bottom which is um, quite low, lower than the one that was mentioned just earlier, but it depends on what you're actually measuring. If you're looking at the whole solar spectrum, it's only a few percent. So the theoretical maximum in the field is between 4.6 and 6 percent. The measured efficiency is actually much lower. So it's normal to get one or two, three percent efficiency. So you're, you're only getting a few percent energy uh, conversion with crops. The main reason is this not absorbed by chlorophyll thing at the top, uh, but it's also uh, it's quite rare to find a crop that's totally adapted to its environment. So you do get this um, lowering of efficiency. Okay. Right. So anyway. So the reason why I find growing plants in, in controlled conditions fascinating is that in fact we can lose these energetic challenges, we can help the plant overcome these inherent energetic challenges. So if we're using artificial light, we can just use light where we know it's going to be absorbed by chlorophyll, we can control to an extent the amount reflected and transmitted, uh, we can control the inefficiency of photochemistry depending on the blue-red ratio that we're using. Uh, and we can also, surprisingly, regulate these metabolic losses. We can't do much about the cost of carbohydrate synthesis, but these, these respiratory factors, and particularly photorespiration, <coughs> if we pump in the CO2, okay, this is something that people do already in uh, tomato and glass houses, just as an example. We can double productivity because we overcome these metabolic losses. So we, the, the, these energetic challenges the plants face can be overcome. I think we can push that even further um, with new technology. I have to mention, um, particularly with Nils here, that um, uh, the techniques in radiation use efficiency, many of these techniques were actually pioneered at Nottingham, so the, the measurements that were uh, that we used to measure radiation use efficiency, people will refer back to um, a chap called John Monteith, and he, he, he helped establish this relationship between intercepted radiation and biomass. And what he did, along with others, is actually central to our understanding of how uh, crop productivity works. Uh, and there's also this penman monteith equation you may have heard of that's used by the FAO to calculate adaptive transpiration. So we do have some kind of pedigree in this area in Nottingham. And, um, Something called precision agriculture is also uh, 
uh, has a similarity with vertical farming. This, this chap here is measuring spectral reflectance of the maize crop, and by doing this, by measuring the signature, he can assess whether this plant is short of nitrogen, and then the right amount of nitrogen or more water can be applied. And this, this is a, a contraption uh, built by Oklahoma State, which does the same thing but completely automated. So it has a series of sensors uh, which sense the, the, the need for nitrogen almost on a plant-by-plant -plant basis. There's a computer on board and it applies nitrogen in, almost individually to each plant and this avoids excess runoff of nitrogen. Okay. So it just, this is, that, that's often called precision agriculture. And it has a lot of similarities, I think, with vertical farming, because what you're doing with vertical farming is you're increasing the level of control and resource for each plant, and this is, this is important. Okay, so the difference to me is about control and resources, and if you, I, I drew this, this is, this is my uh, understanding, basic understanding uh, of, of how um, uh, systems might work. So if you're looking at natural light, there's not much you can do. Uh, in terms of trying to get as much of it onto your crop as, as possible. You've got plant management and plant biology. But if you're controlling the amount of light, as, as well as controlling CO2, water and nutrients via a control system, you can also provide as much light as the plant needs. But there's also another opportunity to put something else in, and that is sensing and optimizing the plant physiological status. And there is technology now which enables us to do this. So we could actually put an extra loop in here where we could sense the, the, the photosynthetic potential, even the health of the plants, and this can be uh, fed back to a control system and adjusted accordingly. And I'll explain that more about that in a minute. So I think, um, uh, you probably heard this before actually, but prioritizing for vertical farming obviously depends on the, the type of phenology of the crop in question. Uh, growing a rice or grain crop would be completely different to growing a a salad crop. I think that photosynthetic efficiency under low light may be more important than in, in field systems. That's something that, that I do study. Also, light capture. How do you avoid the, 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 the wastage of light? Uh, so you, you might say uh, one thing you need is a, is, a, is a canopy to be there in the first place to absorb the light. And artificial light is not free. So we use an LED-based cabinet um, uh, made by Photon Systems Equipment. <coughs> They're in the uh, Czech Republic. Uh, it, it provides blue and red uh, light. We, we also have uh, chlorophyll fluorescent sensors. So chlorophyll fluorescent sensors measure the amount of light given off by chlorophyll. Chlorophyll gives off a certain amount of light. And by measuring the proportion of light that's re-emitted, from chlorophyll as fluorescence, we can measure photosynthetic efficiency uh, very, very rapidly. So this is what we do uh, during the plant growth. You can also image it. Okay. So we use this uh, for looking at um, uh, radiation use, of light use efficiency on, on a, on a uh, single plant level. And we had a project last year. This again was funded by the. Um, the project that Gerald mentioned, which is Jumpstart. So uh, Sandeep was a master's student who uh, started a, a project looking at uh, germination under LED, comparing it to glasshouse light. So we're basically testing our cabinet to see how, how it works. And we tested a large number of, of uh, salad crops and uh, found that there was no difference in germination rate between uh, LED and a, and a glasshouse system even when you accounted for the differences in, in thermal time. The other thing we're using this uh, cabinet for is photosynthesis and fluctuating light. So some of my basic research concerns improving the efficiency of photosynthesis in fluctuating light. This could be relevant in glass house systems, perhaps with uh, supplementary LED light. So photosynthesis is quite slow, actually. If, it, if light changes, it's usually slow to respond. So we're looking at improving the efficiency of photosynthesis in dynamic light. And LEDs are great for this because you can program fluctuate, rapid fluctuations. Okay, so if we take low light systems and uh, we say we want to improve light capture and photosynthetic efficiency, I think that's, that, that's critical. 
and we also want to avoid wastage of light uh, during canopy development. This is also something that affects uh, crops uh, in the field. <coughs> so I was wondering whether we can use uh, techniques that I mentioned, like reflectance imaging and uh, chlorophyll fluorescence imaging, for assessing not just plant size, uh, but also physiological status uh, and photosynthetic efficiency and also health of the plant. So we can also measure diseases using chlorophyll fluorescence. This is uh, a, a, a typical fluorescence imaging system, again made by a photo systems uh, uh, instrument. And this, this system here effectively is applying, it, it's an experimental system, it's not for growing plants, but it's, it's applying an actinic light and measuring chlorophyll fluorescence so you can, you can image the entire uh, plant, the, the, the fluorescence of the given off by the entire plant, and this will give you an indication of variation in photosynthetic efficiency, and also, uh, if you have disease, it will show up. I'll skip over that. So, and this goes back to a question I think somebody had earlier. Is why is measuring photosynthesis in low-light systems so important? It's simply because photosynthesis easily saturates under high light, and it, this happens in the field. If you, if you plot photosynthetic rate against light intensity uh, for, a, for a C3 uh, system, you, you won't get a straight line. It will saturate at relatively low light levels, normally about half full sunlight. There's really no point applying more than half full sunlight to a leaf, because it won't photosynthesize anymore. So if you're applying artificial light to a leaf, there's no point Going, going beyond a certain level, you won't get any photosynthesis out. Okay. It's different if you're looking at a, uh, a, a deep canopy with many layers of leaves. So I was wondering whether you could actually use a, a fluorescence imaging based system to actually detect and test the photosynthetic capacity of the plant and adjust the LED intensity so it only sits on this part where the leaf is really responsive, thereby you would save the energy to the LED. And you could also uh, perhaps use it to uh, sense a canopy that wasn't fully developed. This is very important in uh, crop canopy development. You only get the highest rate of productivity when you absorb all of the light or you intercept all of the light. A very basic, very basic fact. So if you were uh, had a system where you could uh, image fluorescence and reflectance at the same time. Uh, you could sensibly vary the canopy health and direct uh, light uh, only, uh, maybe this, this already exists, I don't know, direct light only where plants uh, are, uh, are located and also apply the right quality for the particular stage of growth. So if you wanted an early rapid leaf expansion stage, which is very um, desirable in a, in a field system, you could perhaps supply more far red. And then when the, when the canopy was fully developed, you could supply more blue, which would thicken up the leaves and increase the photosynthetic capacity. So you can imagine all kinds of ways in which you can manipulate the canopy of the plant to achieve the greatest light use efficiency. Again, I'm, I'm imagining things here. But, um, it seems to me there are lots of possibilities that we could look at. And you can apply the same thing for CO2 enrichment, as well, if you were enriching the system with CO2. I was going to talk about um, uh, the Green Revolution, this was covered by, by Zoe earlier, because I was simply wondering how that takes too much time to explain. Um, so I was just wondering about the whole uh, idea behind crop improvement for the field crops is improving morphology and physiology and genetic improvement. And no one seems to have mentioned the genetic improvement of plants and crops for growing in vertical farming systems. Do we need two, for example, this is an, this is a, an ideal uh, rice crop. It's, a, it's very, very short. Okay, it's less than a metre tall. It has a huge amount of biomass put into leaf and into grain and not much into stem. Do we need, uh, that's called idiotyping, it's calculating the best physiology and the best morphology of the plant. Do we need to do some idiotyping of plants for vertical farming? Okay. 
genes that control uh, leaf erectness, for example, rice is better with upright leaves, is the, the, the genetic control is very simple. So perhaps there's an opportunity to idiotype uh, plants from vertical farming systems. That will depend on the type of plant. Okay, um, I have a summary slide, but you don't want to read it. <coughs> I've said it already. So I was just also interested um, by in, in Dixon's book where he showed these pictures of what you might call fantasy vertical farming systems. And this is perhaps the wrong one to choose because it really is a fantasy one. But I was looking at this thinking this really looks like a, a plant canopy. And perhaps, and, and this is a plant canopy. And you would apply the same principles to measuring light sufficiency in this kind of <coughs> as you would in a, um, a plant country. And it's funny that earlier we were talking about stacking layers of plants in a, in a building. When we talk about uh, measuring photosynthesis at different layers of the canopy, we talk about stacking units of photosynthesis. So the language I discovered just now is similar. So perhaps there's some similarity in terms of the disciplines we use for plant science and architecture. Okay, um, I'll, I'll stop there, so thanks very much. Thanks very much, Eric. Okay. Questions for Eric? One or two questions. Yes, please. Um, you said it's uh, quite easy to reach uh, for synthetic uh, saturation and the 50% of the mass. But what about all the other factors? Is that assuming that all other factors, such as temperature, CO2, and water, etc., yeah. are optimal? Yeah. yeah, I mean, you're assuming you're, you're, you're in, in, in a window of optimal conditions to, to do that. Obviously, if you raise temperature, you'll, you'll change the point at which the curve uh, levels off. Yes, yeah, definitely. Yeah, from the back. Did you, um, in the Hebrew experiments, as we're talking about vertical crime, did you, from my own account, did you have any problems with stacking the plants on top of each other and the heat? Lighting systems that you're using generates. If you stack them on top of each other, as you go up the layers, the heat tends to accumulate. Yeah. Well, we, we don't, to be the terms, we don't stack plants because we have to keep the light level uh, constant. But we have done experiments where we do grow plants underneath just, just to lower the, the light. And yeah, there is a problem, we need to mix the air. How many layers have you done? Have you uh, just, just, just two. Just Only two? two? Yeah. yeah. Our priorities are sort of really good. Yeah. yeah. Take one more, yes, please. It seems like the, the photosynthesis is not completely optimized for the incoming light radiation, and so that's that's a bummer. But there you go; it's not perfect resolution. Um, is, do you think there's a, a, a role for fluorescent finishes um, that trans that refluoresce the light frequencies at photosynthetically active frequencies, taking on yeah, I mean, I, I've heard about people doing this. I think it only works at the, uh, the lower light wavelength. So to, to re-emit, you have to re-emit at a higher wavelength. So you would have to uh, absorb blue and re-emit red, or absorb UV and re-emit you know, re blue. I think those materials, I don't know much about it, actually, but yeah, it's definitely a possibility for them. Yeah, so that, that, that would be a really good idea. You, sorry, you can do the opposite as well. A conversion where you would absorb two photon red with low energy that would bring blue. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, you need more. <coughs> yes, so yes, you, you can produce one to a few. Yeah. 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 <coughs> oh, certainly. Yeah. That, that would be nice. So you can buy that. <laughs> you have the one to buy. Quite the same thing. Great. Thanks very much, Eric. That's totally good.